Thank you, Rishi, for joining me today. You know, what a year <laughs> with a lot of turmoil <laughs> built into it. Yet. Uh, yeah, and it's not even over yet. But what's interesting to me is that as we get to the end of December, around the world, with low interest rates everywhere, we're hearing that investors are getting very impatient, that they really want to see their manager start to put money to work. Uh, of course, we knew from the beginning of this crisis that having some money on hand for a tough time is helpful, too. But they're also finding difficulties in putting this money to work as in some places valuations are surging and in some places there's significant distress. How are you looking at investment opportunities in this uh, period right now? Yeah, well, first of all, it's great to see you again, uh, Sonali, even though it's uh, virtual. Uh, and and thanks to IEFA uh, for, for having me on uh, today. I missed the opportunity to have been there in person, but that time will come, uh, I'm sure. Um, and, and look, you're right. I think um, investors, broadly speaking, um, are anxious on one hand, to navigate a path through the uncertainty that really I think very few people uh, have living memory around uh, today uh, in the investment world, but on the other hand uh, are also keen to not uh, miss the opportunity to generate outsized uh, return. Uncertainty, you know, and we all know, is basically table stakes in investing, right? Uncertainty actually creates opportunity. Uh, what has happened, arguably, is that actually there is less uncertainty on certain fronts today than you would typically come to imagine. And what I mean by that is certainly on the monetary policy front and on the fiscal policy front, the actions taken by governments worldwide have basically put a bit of a floor to uncertainty um, in terms of the foreseeable future, because you know that there is a whole of government response to keeping interest rates low, ultra loose monetary policy, and not really tightening fiscal conditions as well. In fact, providing fiscal stimulus to tide out the pandemic. That leads to a glut of uh, liquidity uh, and hence uh, rising valuations, which is what we are seeing across the board. Now for us, what we've done Sonali is, is, is the classic buy hold sell analysis. We've taken the entire investment landscape and bucketed it, bucketed it into three categories. One category, is those sectors that clearly require some reimagination in the new world, right, post-pandemic. Typical example would be something like business travel, because business travel is inevitably going to be very different going forward uh, now that we've all realized that uh, video conferencing is, in fact, a good proxy for uh, traveling for internal meetings in, in particular. Th those sectors, uh, in our view, uh, where a reimagination is necessary, by definition, are the most uncertain, and those are in our cell category. Right? Wherever we have an exposure to that, uh, we would look to, to monetize that and probably get on with, uh, with life. Um, the second sec uh, bucket um, that we created are those sectors that are likely to bounce back. In fact, not likely, I should say it with more conviction, ought to bounce back. And these are typical, the best example would be leisure and entertainment. Uh, I think at some point in time, when people feel safe uh, moving about and being in crowds, leisure and entertainment is going to come back. Uh, and we are comfortable holding these. But more importantly, um, we are comfortable doubling down on these. And this is the space where you know there has been a pretty significant dislocation, like we owned um, uh, a distributor, a seafood uh, distributor in the in the Midwestern United States. Uh, you know, more than fifty percent of their business was supplying fresh seafood to restaurants. It got crushed, but at the same time, their sales to uh, grocery stores went through the roof, right? And but at the you know at the same time, they were able to gain market share relative to other less funded uh, competitors or competitors that had didn't quite have the same reach. So, so that doubling down has really helped. So speaking of that, it, it draws to a really great point, and uh, that's supply chain. A lot of the companies that everyone is investing in de uh, depends on the supply chains moving forward. Yet we have gotten a very different view about globalization this year than we've had in the years coming up to this year. Uh, how might supply chains be impacted and impact the way that you invest? Yeah, so, you know, 
Um, I think this whole um, trend towards deglobalization initially was really a euphemism for uh, the trade spat uh, between initially China and the U.S. and then the rest of the developed world, stemming from a conclusion by the rest of the developed world that it was not a level playing field in terms of trade uh, with China. That's how it started. What has happened in the pandemic is that in addition to a non-level playing field, most countries have realized that they need to build redundancy and resilience into their supply chains, particularly around essential goods uh, and medical supplies, et cetera. That, both of these trends, Sonali, are, are here to stay. I mean, there is no getting around it. Now, for us, again, what that means is, you know, with that change in supply chains, and with that change in geopolitical rhetoric around you know globalization it is going to it has created uh, it is going to maybe is a little too forward looking it has created opportunities for firms like investcorp so for example there is a withdrawal of capital um, supplied by chinese firms in the tech space right chinese investment firms used to be pretty active investors particularly in southeast asia investing behind uh, uh, tech-enabled enterprises. That has you know, slowed down meaningfully, which creates a great opportunity for players like us to come in and be the provider of that capital. There has been a slowdown of capital provided by US and European firms into China tech because of the, you know, this turf war almost that is going on between the two um, sides around tech infrastructure. And that creates opportunity for us to invest in China tech because there is a clear tendency towards autarky, right? The four big economic blocks, US, China, EU, and India, all of them are moving towards autarky. They want to be self-sufficient, whether it's their supply chain, whether it's their tech infrastructure, whether it's their consumption. If all of them want the same thing, well, guess what? You know, you're going to find multiple opportunities to well, capitalize. Now let's add in another factor then. We have Joe Biden, who's set to be inaugurated as the U.S. president at the end, at the end of January. Um, how might his entrance into the political landscape change U.S.-Europe relations, U.S.-China relations, and the way you think about investing as some of that calculus changes? So those are not the same. Uh, and I think there are really three three areas in which, from an investment perspective, the new administration has an immediate bearing on how we would think, at least. But let's start with the domestic agenda first, right? Um, we are very hopeful that with the uh, incoming administration, the U.S. is going to focus on um, upgrading its uh, infrastructure, both tech and non-tech. And that will create not just um, employment and economic growth, but it will create multiple opportunities downstream, right? You don't have to be a direct infrastructure investor, uh, but downstream, it will create multiple opportunities for us to uh, to participate in. And we, we think that that is a positive uh, move. In terms of Europe, I mean, we'll have to see, um, but the likelihood over here is that some of the noise, actually it relates both to Europe and China, some of the noise surrounding the long-term signal might dissipate. I think in particular with Europe, we expect a uh, more um, constructive tone, uh, let's call it that, which means that at least the threat of tariff-induced uh, vulnerabilities in businesses that were operating on a transatlantic basis is reduced. So it's a lowering of the risk profile not really much about um, new investment opportunity per se. On China, as I was saying earlier, it's highly unlikely beyond the, you know, the lowering of the rhetoric, it's highly unlikely that we get back to what it was like before, right? So that autarky, you know, is likely to persist as well. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about your approach to China? Obviously, there are geopolitical issues there. Um, how are you navigating it? I mean, we have the benefit of being a truly global investor um, and given our roots in the Middle East, which is literally the middle point between China and the United States, we can, you know, literally claim to be in the middle, um, not really, uh, you know, kind of influenced uh, overtly or otherwise by, you know, what may be uh, a geopolitical uh, tension in the backdrop. 
So that gives us um, and has given us a great opportunity to invest behind the key long-term trends in China. The first investment we made in China, you know, I was talking about this whole drive towards you know, self-reliant tech infrastructure and con consumption focus. That was our first investment in China in partnership with a very large Chinese um, SOE uh, where we invested in a portfolio of very large consumer-focused tech enterprises catering to the domestic Chinese economy, mostly in a pre-IPO kind of situation. Our second um, venture into China was partnering with another very large SOE around um, investing in major Asian food brands that supply into China, catering to the rising middle income and demand for branded, branded food uh, with high content of health and safety embedded into it and quality. And our third uh, foray into China very recently has been investing in the Chinese healthcare ecosystem. Uh, on a tech-enabled basis again. So these are all, you know, there's a theme over here. None of these investments, Anali, relied on China exporting something to the rest of the world. They are all about investing in Chinese companies that cater to Chinese consumers. Well, speaking of the Chinese consumer, and it's something, you know, uh, earlier this year, I'd spoken to Jane Frazier, who's now going to be taking over as Citigroup uh, CEO. And one of the concerns she had about the Chinese market was the consumer and what it looked like coming out of this pandemic. How has this pandemic changed your calculus around how you're looking at some of the trends that you're investing on? Yeah, so I think the one trend we are backing most, and there are two or three at least, but the one trend we are backing most on the part of the consumer is an accelerated of uh, digital adoption, right? Now, if I, you know, what I mean by that is consumers globally now are much more comfortable uh, using uh, their phone or you know, tablet as their primary consumption channel for goods and services, uh, both ordering online uh, or streaming online, whatever the case may be. Now, that if I call that the gold rush, our primary investment theme behind it is not to be a prospector ourselves, go looking for gold, but to find the prospectors and supply them with shovels. Right? And that in our mind, you know, that enablement side of, um, of this investment thesis is probably the most compelling. And the way we've implemented it is investing in e-commerce uh, logistics uh, providers, investing in uh, warehouses and last mile distribution centers, investing in you know, online um, consumer platforms that are tech enabled, like for example, recently, uh, fresh seafood, you know, literally boat to table, right? Uh, provider of uh, fresh seafood. So all of these, you know, are feeding into the same uh, thing. The other way, to, you know, to play it, just you know, using the same analogy of prospectors and shovels, is most consumer-focused businesses have no choice now but to digitize their platforms to enable their consumers to access their goods and services online. Helping them digitize is another major uh, theme for us. So we've invested in a software provider uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in another uh, platform that provides consulting services. I'm going to say one, one last thing, and this you'll relate to, because this is um, something that happened very recently. So when this pandemic broke out, most of us, I think, concluded, uh, Sonali, that working from home or flexible working is probably going to be another trend that uh, is going to, you know, become part of our normal uh, working practices. Not necessarily 100%, but some level of flexible working. Well, what does that mean? It means that you, I, or you know, everyone we know that is using their home computer suddenly has to protect themselves against cyber vulnerability, right? So we invested in the heart of the pandemic in May in a cybersecurity platform, right? Avira in Europe. We just sold it eight months. This is a record turnaround for Investcorp. We've never sold anything that quickly. Just sold it at a very, very strong return to our investors in less than a year. And uh, you know that's another classic example of long-term trends that you know are inevitably taking hold in terms of 
different consumer behavior post pandemic. So that is extraordinarily interesting. And you know, this was eight months ago that you had acquired this. I mean, the economy was in a different place. Valuations may have been in a different place. We've obviously seen this huge elevation of uh, valuations beside behind tech enabled companies. Uh, I know you had said that you are not trying to join the gold rush necessarily, but you know, what concerns do you have? It's interesting because everything you're saying around digital adoption is what I'm hearing from every investor. And, you know, if, uh, and I know you are taking a certain approach to it, but I'm wondering what happens if everybody starts to rush in. Um, it, it, the question is, what do they rush into? So, it, you know, it, it's really going to be, we are not looking for um, the outsized one hit wonder. We are looking for sustainable long-term return, right? Which is resilient in nature and not necessarily looking, you know, going to be a one-time thing. So wanna, it's mm-hmm. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to pivot a little bit too and make sure we had time to speak on another very important theme that's been uh, really on investors' minds for a while, but I think even more so this year, where we've seen a lot of issues uh, compounding even just the COVID crisis, and that's ESG. I do want to start with the E part of that equation. You know, given your linkage to the Middle East and uh, the oil market here, how do you think about uh, ESG more broadly and and your relationship to oil? Yeah, I mean, I think those are both uh, very relevant questions. And you're right. I think it's brought um, the whole topic under a sharper uh, spotlight uh, over the course of the last several months. So in my view, or in our view, uh, Sonali, there is a maturity cycle associated with uh, ESG. You know, it started off as being uh, a bit of a marketing gimmick. I'm sorry to say this out loud, but you know what I mean, right? It was a little bit of a marketing gimmick. You include it in your pitch book, and you think that some investors will like the sound of it and will gravitate towards you uh, as a GP, as a manager. Then, uh, you know, it migrated to becoming a compliance issue, right? So you, you had to have it. In your, in your pitch book so that the prospective investor could tick a box, right? And then I think over the last, I would say, 18 months, we have you know migrated from it being marketing and compliance-led to being risk mitigation and genuine opportunity seeker, right? So what I mean by risk mitigation is it's not just do no harm, right? It's also about actively seeking out the likelihood of the companies, the investments that you make, the environments that you operate in being vulnerable to a deficit of either you know, social uh, factors, governance uh, weaknesses, or uh, you know, not being alert to environmental damage or climate change, you know, all of the factors associated with that. I think that change has really started settling in, in people's minds. We are certainly, you know, at that level uh, in terms of looking actively, trying to peek around the corner and say, you know, in, in the businesses, in the assets we are investing, what are the risks surrounding future ESG considerations that would make the attractiveness of that business vulnerable uh, in, in, you know, in three years, five years from today? and mitigating those. It's not just identification, it's actually mitigating those risks. And then the next step of the journey for us, and I suspect many of our peers is going to be the natural leap from mitigating the risk to actively seeking out ways in which you can invest in businesses and assets that are by design opportunity, you know, an opportunity to do better on the E or the ES or the G front. It's, much, it's a little bit like being digitally enabled. So now you and I are digitally native rather, right? You and I remember the time when, you know, there were two types of companies almost, right? Those that were digitally native because they never did anything other than be, you know, on an app. And those that tried to make the transition from being a legacy business into being a digital. And there's a difference in the mindset and the DNA and the culture. And I suspect where we are going is migrating from that legacy move away from, uh, you know, do no harm to actively seeking out opportunities to do good. 
So speaking of that, too, I do want to draw that question back to the energy industry, mostly because I think it's where we're seeing the most progress among investors and global investors, large pension funds that um, have been talking to us all year about very active steps they're taking. Um, what are some of the considerations, particularly as it pertains to energy? Um, we are, you know, look, um, very little direct relevance to us, to be honest, uh, Sonali, other than the reference you made earlier to the fact that our roots trace back to the Gulf where a big component of their domestic economy is energy related. We are not really active investors in the energy space ourselves. If you look at our portfolio today, you know, you'll find virtually nothing. Um, we are in one company which is providing non-destructive testing services, which is downfield. So you know, th that has never really been uh, a major area of consideration or focus for us. But I know in the local economies in the Middle East, there is an intense focus, you know, on the part of many of the sovereigns themselves in terms of transitioning to, you know, renewable energy sources and just trying to bear in mind that their core economic base around hydrocarbons is something that they want to mitigate the risk around and diversify a bit. What about some of the other areas? You had mentioned uh, the potential for opportunities to, to, to put more money to work. What are some of those opportunities looking like to you? Have you made any investments that you think will do particularly well, even in terms of returns? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, you know, the one um, platform I briefly alluded to earlier in our conversation um, is the platform. It's called, it's a company called Fresh to Home. Right? It's based in India, actually. It's a tech-enabled provider of online uh, seafood uh, grocery services to consumers all over India. But what they have done, Sonali, is remarkable. They have basically aligned themselves with the poor fishermen, you know, across the you know coastal villages. And there are hundreds of such coastal villages uh, across the, uh, you know, Indian landscape and thousands of such fishermen, you know, who don't have any access to any organized selling platforms, et cetera, who don't have any, any, any access to organized logistics. And they have become the aggregator, you know, as a service, not the aggregator in terms of, you know, bulking up on procurement power, but aggregators as, as a service to these fishermen to organize their entire supply chain, if you will, you know, from the, from the ocean when they catch the fish to the market when they auction it to the, you know, to the cold chain for transportation all the way to the table and the fork, right? That's doing good. You know, you and I, I think, can relate to this. That is what I mean by, by being an actual opportunity seeker, because it's not just the, you know, the fad around tech enabled and digital and this, that, and the other. There are hundreds of e-tailers, right? Hundreds of e-grocers, I'm sure. But this, we think, is unique. And that is what, you know, attracted us to the platform. There's so much that I could ask you about, really. And, you know, we only have a few minutes left here. So I think what I want to end on is how do you fundamentally think that your job and the way that you look to deploy money will change as we head into 2021 and we start to look past this very horrible pandemic? I think we are going to have to contend with the, the reality of a, a very low, ultra low interest rate environment and therefore diminishing returns uh, across the traditional asset classes, and therefore greater pressure on the private markets. And, you know, I think it's basically just an avalanche uh, snowball effect, right? When you have greater pressure to deploy capital into the private markets with all the dry powder, et cetera, that's available, and the opportunity set continues to shrink, you're going to have to contend with lower return expectations and higher valuations, right? So reconciling, and it's it's not a, a, something that we can take for granted as an Ali. Neither the investor base, nor frankly, you know, we as as managers of that capital, are particularly well geared, you know, to accepting a secular depression in uh, long term uh, yields and returns, expected returns. And the only way you can rationalize that is by lowering the risk correspondingly. Now, you know, some part of lowering the risk is going to be investing behind long-term strong, you know, growth trends, as we discussed. Some part of lowering that risk is going to be doing, you know, inve making investments that actually 
are truly opportunity seekers on the ESG spectrum, as again, we, we discussed. This is all new to us. This is not in our muscle memory, right? Uh, yes, we have been prepared for it for some time, but we have to really actually execute on it uh, from 2021 onwards. Uh, thank you so much, Rishi, for your time. This has been an incredible conversation, and I hope to be able to do this again with you soon. And thank you to the Conference of Montreal for hosting us.